The webinar will begin soon. Please stand by. The webinar will begin soon. Please stand by. The webinar will begin soon. Please stand by. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Laura Morell, and I work in the National Center for Emerging and Zoonotic Infectious Diseases at the Centers for Disease Control and prevention. On behalf of CDC's One Health office, I'm pleased to welcome you to the monthly zoonoses and One Health updates call on April 6, 2022. Next slide, please. Although the content of this webinar is directed to veterinarians, physicians, epidemiologists, and related public health professionals in federal, state, and local positions, CDC has no control over who participates. Therefore, please exercise discretion on sensitive content and material as confidentiality cannot be guaranteed. Today's webinar is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect now. Links to resources from each presentation are available on our website at cdc.gov slash one health slash zohu slash 2022 slash april.html. Next slide, please. Today's presentations will address one or more of the following five objectives. Identify an implication for human, animal, and environmental health. Identify a One Health approach strategy for prevention of public health threats. Identify a One Health approach strategy for detection of public health threats. Identify a One Health approach strategy for responding to public health threats. And list two ways to improve collaborative practice across the public health care team. Next slide, please. In compliance with continuing education requirements, all presenters must disclose any financial or other associations with the manufacturers of commercial products, suppliers of commercial services, or commercial supporters, as well as any use of unlabeled products or products under investigational use. CDC, our planners, presenters, and their spouses and partners wish to disclose they have no financial interests or other relationships with the manufacturers of commercial products suppliers of commercial services, or commercial supporters. The planning committee reviewed content to ensure there is no bias. The presentations will not include any discussion of the unlabeled use of a product or a product under investigational use. CDC did not accept commercial support for this activity. Next slide. Instructions for receiving free continuing education are available at cdc.gov slash onehealth slash Zohu slash continuing education. The course access code is Zohu webcast. To receive free CE for today's webcast, complete the evaluation at cdc.gov slash TCE online by May 9th, 2022. A captioned video of today's webinar will be posted at cdc.gov slash one health slash Zohu slash 2022 slash april.html within 30 days. To receive free CE for the web on demand video of today's webinar, complete the evaluation at cdc.gov slash TCE online by May 10th, 2024. Next slide. Before we begin today's presentations, Dr. Colin Basler, Deputy Director of the One Health Office will share some news and updates. You may begin when you're ready. Thanks, Laura. Hello everyone. Thank you for joining us on today's Zohu call. We appreciate you being here. 
Before our presentations begin, I'd like to share some updates. You can find links to the resources in today's Zohu call email newsletter. If you aren't yet subscribed, please use the link at the top of the main Zohu call webpage to access these resources. Our response to the COVID-19 pandemic continues to evolve. Please check CDC's website for the latest guidance and resources, including information about keeping people as well as animals safe and healthy. Next slide. There is no evidence that animals are playing a significant role in spreading COVID-19 to people, but we continue to see a variety of different animals reported with SARS-CoV-2. In the United States, 362 animals have been reported, including companion animals like cats, dogs, and ferrets, animals in zoos, sanctuaries, or aquaria, including hyenas, large cats, such as lions, tigers, snow leopards, and mountain lions, a binturong, a fishing cat, a kotamundi, otters, and gorillas. We've also seen SARS-CoV-2 in production animals, such as mink, and also in wildlife, including white-tailed deer and mule deer. 18 mink farms have been affected by SARS-CoV-2 in the United States to date. The latest animal case numbers are available on the USDA APHIS website. Guidance for pet owners, mink farmers, and many others are available on CDC's website. Next slide, please. You can find links in today's newsletter to several recent publications, including Advancing Diagnostic Stewardship for Healthcare-Associated Infections, Antibiotic Resistance, and Sepsis, and the Economic Burden of Fungal Diseases in the United States. Next slide, please. We've shared links to several new web resources, including a new One Health in Action story that looks at combating antimicrobial resistance in people and animals, a One Health approach. Next slide. Other resources include the Advanced Molecular Detection Interactive Investment Maps and many others. Next slide, please. Some events and observances of interest include uh, the Preparedness Summit, Reimagining Preparedness in the Era of COVID-19, which is happening the week of April 4th through 7th in Atlanta. Next slide, please. Additional events and observations include Lyme Disease Awareness Month, which is coming up in May, and the 71st Annual Epidemic Intelligence Service, or EIS, conference, which will be held virtually from May 2nd to 5th. Next slide, please. And finally, there are a number of ongoing outbreak investigations, including a Coronavactor outbreak linked to powdered infant formula and a Salmonella outbreak linked to pet bearded dragons. Please visit CDC's Healthy Pets, Healthy People website for a selected list of ongoing and past U.S. outbreaks of zoonotic diseases. We appreciate you sharing the Zohu Call website link with your colleagues from the human, animal, plant, and environmental health sectors and letting them know about the live webinars, video recordings, and free continuing education. Our next call will, text, will take place next month on May 4th. Please send presenter and topic suggestions for future presentations, as well as news from your organizations to zohucall at cdc.gov. And with that, I'll turn the call back over to Laura. Thank you. Next slide, please. You can submit questions at any time using Zoom's Q&A feature. Please include the topic or presenter's name. The Q&A session will follow the final presentation if time permits. You may also email questions to today's presenters. We've included their email addresses on this slide, on the Zohu Call webpage for today's webinar, and in today's email newsletter. Next slide. Our first presentation, One Health Investigations of SARS-CoV-2 Outbreaks in People and Multiple Animal Species on Eight Mink Farms in the United States, Utah, Wisconsin, and Michigan, 2020 to 2021, is by Dr. Natalie Wintling. Please begin when you're ready. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Natalie Wendling. I'm a veterinary medical officer at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And on behalf of all of the One Health collaborators involved, I will be discussing the One Health investigations of SARS-CoV-2 outbreaks in people and multiple animal species on eight farms in the U.S. Next slide, please. I'd like to start by giving you an overview of the global mink farm situation with SARS-CoV-2. Since April 2020, 474 mink farms in 12 countries have been confirmed to have SARS-CoV-2 infection in their mink herds. The Netherlands identified the 
first affected meat farm in the world, and in the following weeks, other countries began reporting positive farms. Denmark was heavily impacted with 290 affected farms. Their reported numbers increased rapidly as a result of active surveillance, including testing mink that may not have showed obvious signs of infection. In 2020, global attention was raised on the high susceptibility of farmed mink to SARS-CoV-2, along with concerns for public and animal health. Worker safety interventions and increased biosecurity measures were put in place on farms around the world. And in 2021 and 2022, fewer positive farms have been identified and the majority of those were found due to active surveillance. This type of surveillance is critical for early detection and tracking potential mutations and variants that could occur in farmed meat populations. Next slide, please. Due to active surveillance in mink and community sequencing, Denmark was able to identify a unique mink-associated variant called Cluster 5 that emerged in August of 2020. This SARS-CoV-2 variant had five characteristic mutations on the spike gene that are listed here. There were 12 human cases identified, and of those 12, eight were linked to mink farms. There were concerns this variant would cause decreased sensitivity to neutralizing antibodies, which prompted the Danish government to order the depopulation of 17 million mink. In December of 2020, the World Health Organization published a statement reporting that the five mutations that make up this variant had not been seen since September 2020 and were no longer circulating in humans. This variant has not been identified since. Next slide, please. In the United States, we have identified 18 affected farms in five states. In the states reported by USDA, there are 12 affected farms in Utah, three in Wisconsin, one in Michigan, and one in Oregon. In most cases, these herds experienced acute disease ranging from mild respiratory signs to increased mortality or mink die-offs ranging from 15 to 50% of the mink herd, which prompted investigations and testing to confirm SARS-CoV-2. CDC has deployed field teams to eight farms, and I have been fortunate to deploy three times to Utah to support investigations and outbreak response. Affected mink farms in the US were placed under quarantine, meaning no animals or animal byproducts could leave the farms until they met state mandated criteria for quarantine release. We continue to work with USDA and state animal health, public health and wildlife officials, industry and other partners on research and surveillance initiatives. Next slide. Let's take a look at a timeline for U.S. mink farm outbreaks and response. In April of 2020, I mentioned that the Netherlands reported the first SARS-CoV-2 infections in farm mink. The CDC One Health Office began engaging partners to develop guidance for preventing introduction of SARS-CoV-2 on U.S. mink farms and investigating how many and where mink farms were located in the U.S. From May to July, coordination efforts began between U.S. and international partners to address One Health concerns of SARS-CoV-2 in animals. CDC and USDA developed guidance documents to prepare for and address SARS-CoV-2 outbreaks in farm to mink in the U.S. In June of 2020, Denmark and Spain also started reporting SARS-CoV-2 in farmed meat. Then on August 17th, USDA's National Veterinary Services Laboratories confirmed the first SARS-CoV-2 infection in farmed meat in the United States. On August 18th, CDC and Utah state officials began on-farm investigations on multiple Utah meat farms. On October 2nd, USDA confirmed SARS-CoV-2 infection in farmed meat from Wisconsin and Michigan. CDC field teams deployed to begin investigations in collaboration with state public health and animal health officials in Wisconsin, Michigan, and returned to Utah for a second time to conduct on-farm investigations. As I mentioned earlier, in November 2020, the Cluster 5 mink-associated variant was identified and all farmed mink in Denmark were ordered to be culled by the Danish government. To close out the year, USDA Wildlife Services confirmed SARS-CoV-2 in a wild mink, and CDC deployed a team to Utah for a third on-farm field investigation. State officials and CDC shared information publicly throughout the course of these investigations. Next slide. US One Health investigations focused on multiple aspects of response and control of SARS-CoV-2 on mink farms. These on-farm Investigations included important One Health collaborations with local, state, and federal public health, 
agriculture, and wildlife partners. CDC worked with state officials for testing of humans, mink, companion animals, and some wildlife on farm and completed epidemiologic investigations. USDA Wildlife Services worked with state agriculture and wildlife officials to test wildlife and other animal species on and around farms. We looked at transmission dynamics between animals and people, along with genomic sequencing and comparative analysis of the virus in people and animals. We provided worker safety resources and training for farm staff on worker safety and preventing the introduction and spread of SARS-CoV-2 on farms, along with resources on mental health and suicide prevention. Lastly, we provided recommendations to ensure appropriate biosecurity measures on farms. Next slide. So what have One Health partners been doing? On-farm One Health investigations, laboratory confirmation of SARS-CoV-2 in animals, wildlife trapping and testing on and off farms, comparative analysis of SARS-CoV-2 sequences in people and animals, generating guidance, recommendations, and toolkits, worker safety web webinars for mink farm workers and processors, and working to address gaps in active surveillance for mink farms in the United States. Next slide, please. Here's what we currently know about SARS-CoV-2 and mink. We know that mink are highly susceptible to SARS-CoV-2 infection. And these infections may involve mild to severe clinical signs with die-offs or may be subclinical with no apparent illness. Mink can spread SARS-CoV-2 to mink and other animals in the farm environment. And extra precautions must be taken to protect mink, other animals, and people on and around farms. Next slide, please. From the U.S. mink farms investigated, most farmers noted the animals went off feed before they showed any other clinical signs. This was followed by coughing, sneezing, severe nasal and ocular discharge with crusting lesions. In the Netherlands and Canada, they saw mink with diarrhea. However, this has not been noted on U.S. farms to date. On most farms in the U.S., the clinical signs progressed to labored breathing and death. The disease moved rapidly through the facilities both within and between barns or sheds. They typically experienced seven to 10 days of high mortality rates, followed by an extended period of sickness. From these initial investigations, older animals were more affected with higher morbidity and mortality than younger animals, and severe pneumonia was seen in most affected adult mink. Next slide. Humans, mink, and domestic animals were tested by CDC and state animal health and public health officials. It varied from farm to farm, but CDC, USDA Wildlife Services, and state wildlife officials tested wildlife, peri-domestic species, and escaped mink on or around the perimeter of mink farms. Off-farm testing of wildlife and peri-domestic species was performed by USDA Wildlife Services and state wildlife officials. Next slide, please. This slide outlines what we know to date about transmission of SARS-CoV-2 on mink farms. We know that SARS-CoV-2 infection spreads most commonly from person to person. Infected people, either with or without symptoms, initially introduce the virus to the herd. Once it's introduced, the mink spread the virus quickly to other mink. We are still learning about how long mink are affected with the virus and how it can spread to other animals on farm like dogs, cats, and wildlife, including wild mink. Mink to human transmission has been reported in several countries in Europe. At this time, data suggests that mink to human transmission was possible on one farm in Michigan, but could not be confirmed based on the data available. Because there are so few genetic sequences available from the communities, communities around the farm, it was not possible to confirm whether the mutations came from mink on the farm or were already circulating in the community. Next slide, please. This is a mink only phylogenetic divergence tree that contains all publicly available unique global mink sequences and US mink sequences from Utah, Wisconsin, Michigan, and Oregon. Through this analysis, we know that US mink investigation sequences are unique from mink sequences in Europe. No US farms had all mutations found in mink associated variant cluster five that was identified in Denmark. However, Every U.S. farm had one or two mutations seen either in Denmark or the Netherlands. Next slide. 
Public health and animal health recommendations for preventing SARS-CoV-2 introduction on meat farms include screening and restricting access to the farm, especially buildings where animals are kept, physical distancing between farm workers when possible on the farm, wearing personal protective equipment, even when you don't feel sick while working with and around mink, staying home when you are sick, staying up to date on the recommended COVID-19 vaccinations, cleaning and disinfecting surfaces and equipment, and quarantining or separating newly acquired meat before introducing them to the herd. We are aware that meat are being vaccinated on farms in the U.S. as an additional preventative measure, and we're working with partners to understand the impact these vaccines have on public and animal health. Next slide, please. The key messages for meat that we'd like for you to take home today include the following. There is currently no evidence that animals, including mink, are playing a significant role in the spread of SARS-CoV-2 to people. For most people in the U.S., the risk of SARS-CoV-2 infection from animals is low. However, there is a higher risk for people working on mink farms. Mink farms should follow available guidance for farmed mink to prevent the introduction of SARS-CoV-2. Following worker safety guidelines is critical to protect people and animals on mink farms. Meat farm workers should be vaccinated and stay up to date on their COVID-19 vaccines. And finally, meat farm workers with COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2 infections should avoid contact with animals, especially mink. Next slide, please. I'd like to highlight a list of resources for SARS-CoV-2 and mink that can be found on the following websites. Next slide, please. And lastly, I'd like to acknowledge the following groups and organizations that made these investigations possible through successful One Health collaborations. And in the absence of regulations for farmed mink, we wanna thank the farm owners, staff, and industry partners for volunteering and cooperating with us on these One Health investigations. Next slide. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next slide, please. Our next presentation, FDA Center for Veterinary Medicine, a One Health partner, is by Dr. Ellen Hart. Please begin when you're ready. Hi, everyone, and thanks to the coordinators for inviting me to speak today on behalf of FDA Center for Veterinary Medicine, or CVM. My name is Ellen Hart. I'm a veterinarian and currently the acting director for international programs and outreach here at CVM. Although I've named today's talk CVM, a One Health partner, I'm really hoping you come away from my brief presentation today, seeing all of FDA as that one health partner, of which I can say with plenty of bias that the Center for Veterinary Medicine is an important part. But we don't do what we do in a vacuum, as I'm sure none of you watching this do either. One health is a team sport. Next slide. In our short time today, I'm planning to spend some time wowing you on some of the basics of what the Center for Veterinary Medicine does and is all about, highlight some of our research and international activities, and then finish off with a high-level overview of our vision for One Health at FDA. Next slide. Starting off discussing CDM, our mission is simple, to protect human and animal health. We often think about One Health as trying to rally a bunch of different expertise areas into a common approach to health. And let me tell you how beautifully that explains CVM and FDA. One of my favorite things about the Center for Veterinary Medicine has honestly always been that when I need to know something, I'm not limited to reading books and publications. I also get to go ask someone who's the expert in that thing because they work here too whether it's veterinary medicine, chemists and toxicologists, microbiologists, human food safety, environmental safety, aquaculture, animal food experts, drug manufacturing, biotechnology, and law, the list seriously goes on. And as I've continued my career here, I've come to realize that all of FDA is kind of like that. A bunch of different experts in one place, all working towards a common mission. And I've had the opportunity to reach out to all different places in FDA, as well as folks in other agencies, to learn from the person that is passionate about that thing. And even better than that, has been the opportunity to get a bunch of these brilliant people together in one room to help answer complex questions. More than making my job here pretty great, 
I think it's safe to say that a One Health approach is foundational to how CVM and FDA solve problems. Next slide. Many of you probably know that FDA, and thus the Center for Veterinary Medicine, is a regulatory agency. What might not be obvious, based on our name, is that we do not regulate the practice of veterinary medicine. Instead, CVM has responsibility for animal drugs, foods, and devices, and has a variety of mechanisms for helping to make sure these products are safe and or effective. Next slide. But before I start regaling you with all of the interesting stuff that CBM does, I thought it would be useful to give you a little flavor of how CBM fits into FDA. Obviously, based on this picture, CBM is both the largest and at the center of it all, right? Okay, so I'll admit this re representation is not to scale and does not show overlap between other FDA centers and offices, represented here by pictures rather than that alphabet soup everyone loves so much. CVM is actually one of the smallest centers in FDA, but it does put CVM in the context of FDA. Our jurisdiction touches almost everything that FDA regulates, making CVM kind of like a microcosm of the rest of the agency. With some exception, what the other FDA centers do for humans, CVM does for all animals. For a few examples, while CVM oversees animal food, our Center for Food Safety and Applied Nutrition, or CIFSAN, oversees human food. CVM also considers the human food safety of residues of animal drugs in meat from food producing animals. CVM approves animal drugs, while our Center for Drug Evaluation and Research approves human drugs. And CVM oversees regenerative medicine and stem cell products for animals. And our Center for Biologic Evaluation and Research, or CBER, oversees regenerative medicine products for humans. Next slide. And maybe by this point, you're realizing that CBM's portfolio might be just a little broader than you had thought. And I thought I'd briefly sp speak to that breadth by touching on some recent highlights. Did you know we've approved certain genome edited animals that make human pharmaceuticals? Did you even know that was a thing? We also recently made a low risk determination, allowing for the marketing of products from genome edited beef cattle following a safety review. We've investigated contaminated pet treats to track down the cause of human salmonella infections, set standards for animal stem cell products, have helped to lead the way on approaches to mitigate antimicrobial resistance, and approve the first animal drug that reduces gas emissions from cattle. We have spent countless hours trying to educate the public about the dangers associated with people taking animal ivermectin products to treat COVID-19 infections. Maybe some of you remember that tweet last year. You're not a horse, you're not a cat. Lastly, we have also approved some of the first topically applied products for cats. And I know that last one seems like an odd mention, but if you've ever had to medicate a cat, I know you get it. Next slide. And briefly, before we move on, I wanted to take this opportunity to mention a couple of resources I wish I had known about while I was in private practice as a veterinarian. And I'm also hoping at least a couple of you out there appreciate just how difficult it was for me to limit myself to only two. The first is where you can find information on animal drug shortages, including how to report possible shortages you might be observing in practice. The second, is about how and where to report a potential problem with an animal drug, device, or food. And I know I said I wish I'd known about these while I was practicing as a veterinarian, but I do recognize that everyone tuning in today is not a vet. This second link is a resource for everyone and can help us get a better understanding of whether there may be problems with the products we regulate. Whether you're a veterinarian, government employee, public health expert, or pet owner, you are our partners too, and on the front lines and vital to helping us protect human and animal health. Next slide. Now that I've completely made you rethink everything you thought you knew about FDA and CVM, or maybe at least some of it, let's talk research. First, let me start off by mentioning that CVM has a dedicated office of research. And interestingly, that there are many research offices and laboratories throughout FDA. 
Next slide. If One Health is all about coordination and collaboration, I don't know what single activity demonstrates that within the federal government better than the National Antimicrobial Resistance Monitoring System, or NARMS. A partnership that involves collaboration with multiple FDA centers and spans multiple federal agencies, FDA, CDC, and USDA, this program is using whole genome sequencing to track resistance of everything from intestinal bacteria in sick people to retail meats, food animals, and surface water. The 2019 publication is set to be released soon. NARMS continues to optimize its approaches and in 2019 modified the retail meat protocol to increase, re increase recovery of salmonella and introduce a new way to calculate multi-drug resistance. Next slide. CVM also supports another laboratory network in addition to NARMS. And if you didn't know that, you're not alone because neither did I before I joined CVM. In a nutshell, CVM's Veterinary Laboratory Investigation and Response Network, or VetLearn, which includes 46 veterinary diagnostic laboratories, investigates potential problems with CVM-regulated products. Pet food, for example. Next slide. And in the last couple of years, VetLearn has also stepped up along with many other federal, state, and private partners to help support One Health efforts related to COVID-19. For example, they have conducted multiple interlaboratory comparison exercises for the many laboratories testing animal samples to evaluate both the specificity and sensitivity of their tests, including making sure laboratories could distinguish between SARS-CoV-2 and other animal coronaviruses, and ensuring that those tests continue to be able to detect new variants. In collaboration with other federal partners, we also developed a checklist to guide veterinarians and laboratories conducting necropsies on deceased animals where SARS-CoV-2 infection was possible. And while I'm speaking to the work done to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic, I wanted to mention the significant amount of work that CVM has done and is still doing to mitigate and address any animal drug shortages, evaluate the animal food supply chain, communicate regularly with our stakeholders, and address the marketing of fraudulent products. Next slide. Touching briefly on international activities. Next slide. CVM is involved in all sorts of different international activities many of which are focused on standardizing and harmonizing international approaches to ensuring animal products around the world are safe and effective. I'm guessing many, or if not most of you watching today are familiar with the OIE, but just in case, it's the World Organization for Animal Health. And a fun fact, in case you're in need of one of those for the dinner table tonight, is that the OIE acronym originated from the original French name, which I will not be attempting to say today, and was retained when they moved to describing the organization in English. That said, CVM is also an OIE collaborating center and contributes to the OIE in a variety of ways, including supporting OIE in putting on regional trainings to help ensure safe and effective veterinary medicines are available around the world. CVM is also part of several established groups, including on both antimicrobial and antiparasitic resistance. Just this past December, the Antiparasitic Resistance Group published on the responsible and prudent use of anthelmintic chemicals to help control resistance in grazing livestock species like cattle, sheep, and goats. These animals are important for producing food and fiber, as well as working the land in many areas of the world. And challenges with resistance to antiparasitic drugs can have important impacts on food and economic security. Next slide. Last but not least, um, as promised, let's circle back to touch on our vision for One Health at both CVM and FDA. Next slide. CVM's mission, protecting, and hu protecting human and animal health, is grounded in One Health, but so too is the whole of FDA. FDA centers work together to protect human, animal, and environmental health 
by ensuring the safety and or efficacy of the products we regulate for both humans and animals. The work FDA does also helps to speed innovation, supports the nation's counterterrorism capability, and a multitude of other things both domestically and globally. In the last few years, FDA has been ramping up its capacity to integrate One Health into operations. And we are excited to further invest in efforts to integrate expertise across multiple centers and offices within FDA. Building on all of the cross-cutting work that is already ongoing at CVM as well as across the agency. We are also looking forward to the opportunity to formalize a more dedicated focal point or hub within FDA, kind of like those that already exist at CDC and USDA, making it easier for other agencies, including those One Health offices and stakeholders like yourself to coordinate with FDA on One Health topics. And finally, we are hopeful that this further focus on One Health will strengthen the FDA's ability to support national and global efforts to research, monitor, prevent, and respond to emerging public health threats and other One Health challenges. Next slide. That completes my presentation for today. Um, for more information about CVM and One Health at FDA, I'm providing a couple of additional links as well as my email address again. I'll be happy to answer any questions that I'm able during the Q&A part of today's Zohu call. Um, and alternatively, for more information on anything I presented today, I'd be happy to point you towards additional CVM uh, experts and resources as appropriate. Thank you. Thank you. Our, our next slide, please. Our final presentation, International Dog Adoptions, Get the Facts, is by Dr. Mark Friedman. Please begin when you're ready. All right, thank you very much. And uh, thank you for inviting me to speak today. Um, I'm Dr. Mark Friedman. I'm a veterinary medical officer uh, with the zoonosis team uh, in the quarantine and border health services branch. And um, I am located at JFK Airport in New York at one of the quarantine stations operated by CDC. Next slide. Uh, I'll be briefly reviewing some CDC entry requirements for importing dogs, and then I'll move on to discussing some international dog adoptions. Um, the importation of animals is governed by multiple agencies that are listed here on this slide, as you can see. It includes the uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture, or USDA, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services, Customs and Border Protection, or CBP, and CDC, and we all work together at ports of entry to ensure the safe importation of animals. Uh, as I mentioned, I'll be discussing some CDC requirements, but uh, for those of you who are looking to import animals, whether they're dogs or others, uh, please be sure to verify with the other agencies what additional requirements they may have for those importations. Next slide. Rabies, one of the deadliest zoonotic diseases, accounts for an estimated 59,000 human deaths globally each year, and dog rabies is responsible for 99% of these deaths. Dog rabies was eliminated from the United States in 2007. However, dog rabies still exists in many countries around the world, and uh, you can see those countries highlighted here in red. The primary focus of CDC's regulation pertaining to dog importations is to prevent the reintroduction of dog rabies, also known as the canine rabies virus variant, or CRVV. In 2020, CDC identified a significant increase compared with the previous two years in the number of dogs imported that were denied entry into the United States from high-risk countries. Due to reduced flight schedules, Dogs denied entry face longer wait times to be returned to their country of departure, and this often led to illness and even death in some cases. In July 2021, CDC announced a temporary suspension of dog importations from high-risk rabies countries. This temporary action was necessary to ensure the health and safety of the dogs imported into the United States and to protect the public's health against the reintroduction of the canine rabies their virus variant or dog rabies into the US. During the temporary suspension, CDC may allow the importation of a small number of dogs from countries that have a high risk of dog rabies on a limited basis. These dogs must have a CDC dog import permit 
prior to arrival at an approved port of entry. In addition, all dogs must also meet US Department of Agriculture and the destination state's entry requirements, which are available um, on the USDA's uh, website. Next slide. CDC entry requirements for dogs imported into the United States are shown in this table, depending on whether the dog is from a high risk or low or no risk country. Uh, for all dogs arriving in the United States required to be healthy upon arrival, they are subject to an examination at the port of entry to rule out zoonotic diseases, which are animal diseases that can be transmitted to humans. Pets may require veterinary medical examination treatment or isolation if they appear seriously ill and may require a necropsy or animal autopsy and possible rabies testing if they arrive deceased. The care, treatment, and testing of pets that arrive ill, injured, or dead will be required by the CDC at the expense of the importer. So for dogs from high-risk countries, CDC requires these dogs to be healthy, as I already mentioned, and at least six months of age. If the dog has a US issued rabies vaccination certificate and microchip, then they are exempt from the suspension and can enter without a permit. If the dog does not have a US issued rabies vaccination certificate, then a CDC dog import permit is needed. For dogs from low or no risk countries, CDC also requires these dogs to be healthy upon arrival and they need to be accompanied by a written or verbal statement that the dog lived in a country not at high risk of rabies for at least six months prior to arriving in the US or since birth. And some examples of written statements can include veterinary records, proof of purchase, or breeder certificates that show the transfer of ownership and demonstrates proof of residency in a low risk or rabies free country. Next slide. So now moving on to adopting. Uh, we often get asked, you know, how can we safely adopt dogs? Um, one thing to do is to prioritize adopting dogs that originated in the United States. However, even when adopting dogs from US-based organizations, additional research uh, is definitely recommended. And before adopting from an international organization, we definitely recommend that you research the organization. And some ways that that can be done um, is to visit the organization in person if possible. Some international organizations do have US offices. The other thing that you can do is read reviews and ask if you could speak to previous clients who have adopted from these agencies to ensure the organization is transparent about the health of the animal and the welfare of the animals that they have for adoption. Unfortunately, uh, many unethical organizations raise dogs in inhumane conditions uh, and they do this in order to make money on adoptions. Puppy mills operating overseas may falsely advertise that the dogs um, that are for adoption are US based. These dogs um, can often be taken away from their mothers at a very early age, um, which can put them you know, at risk for certain health conditions. And these dogs are often raised in poor and overcrowded conditions, which also puts them at high risk for many diseases. Next slide. So if you're thinking about adopting a dog from overseas, what are some of the things you can do? When looking to adopt a new dog from an international organization, we highly uh, warn you to be wary of online pet purchases. Sometimes the advertisements claims that the dogs are already in the US when they are actually physically still in a foreign country. Uh, often we've heard reports that the dog's health can be misrepresented as well as the dog's medical history. So they may advertise a cute little puppy and show you a picture of, you know, say uh, a French bulldog, but the dog that is actually available may not be a, a puppy, may be an adult and may not be that cute French bulldog you were hoping to get. Um, we have gotten reports from the Better Business Bureau that there are more and more scams online. Uh, and this has been especially true during the COVID pandemic as people uh, uh, the demand for adoptions for dogs especially has increased. So uh, it is very advisable to do your research before you adopt using some of the steps that I've previously outlined. Next slide. 
Some other risks to be aware of when you're looking to adopt overseas. Um, some rescue groups, animal welfare organizations, and breeders uh, may misrepresent themselves and the dogs that they sell, rescue, or adopt. The dogs may be a different sex, age, color, or even breed than what you think you're um, looking at. Uh, you know, this is known as bait and switch. Uh, dogs may come with undisclosed health issues. And we have seen dogs arriving with falsified or fraudulent health records and vaccination records. And so that does bring into doubt whether or not the dogs are adequately vaccinated. Some organizations may share compelling or emotional stories about the dog's background that are not always accurate. Uh, an example could be telling you that the dog was rescued from a meat market, but the dog was actually just bred for resale. Um, and as I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, as of last summer, there is a temporary suspension on dog importations from high-risk countries. Dogs imported for adoption or resale from high-risk countries are not eligible for permits or importation during the temporary suspension. However, you should still carefully research the organization uh, if they say they're based out of a low or no-risk country. Uh, we have unfortunately heard reports of dogs being smuggled in from high-risk countries to places like Mexico or Canada, and then being uh, marketed as being from Mexico or Canada, and then brought into the US. And so uh, it just makes you really question, um, you know, what kind of information you're receiving, and therefore the health status of these dogs. Next slide. So some more risks for international adoptions. Um, when you're getting a young puppy internationally, um, these dogs can be put on long flights, and this can put them at risk for travel-related illnesses. Those include uh, the risk of hypo or hyperthermia, so getting too cold or overheating. Uh, there's also a risk for hypoglycemia or low blood sugar, because these young puppies are just not really good at, at that young age at regulating their blood sugar levels. And uh, the stress from the travel can exacerbate illnesses. Uh, and especially if they have a pre-existing illness or are incubating something. And we often can see the dogs becoming ill um, within one week of arrival. Um, also imported dogs risk introducing or the reintroduction of zoonotic and animal diseases of concern. And in no particular order, um, these include such diseases as rabies, brucellosis, leptospirosis, leishmaniasis, uh, parvovirus, distemper, canine influenza, heartworm disease, and even their bedding can potentially, um, or other fomites uh, can potentially bring in diseases that are of concern here. Um, and so we are concerned about African swine fever and foot and mouth disease, as we are seeing outbreaks of these in various countries uh, that uh, do try to bring um, dogs into this country. Next slide. We also have, um, been informed about internet adoption scans. And if you follow the link at the bottom of this slide, um, we do highlight some scams that have been um, exposed. Uh, so that's certainly good reading for your information. CDC does caution consumers to be aware of the potential for fraud involving internet pet purchases or fee for adoption of quote unquote rescued animals. Typically we have found the person offering the animal for adoption uh, will live in another country and claims to be looking for a good home for the animal. The uh, people who have been victims of these scams may be asked to pay adoption fees, medical fees, export fees, and even shipping fees up front before they even get the animal, and then they never receive the animal. Uh, with investigation, it's been found in some cases that the victims have learned that the animal never existed. Um, Unfortunately, there are just a bunch of unscrupulous groups out there uh, that can pose as fraudulent rescue groups. And uh, there are organizations and individuals that are trying to take advantage of this increased demand that we're seeing for dog adoptions during COVID-19. Next slide. So what are some tips for avoiding these scams? If the deal sounds too good to be true, um, it probably is. Do your research about the costs of typical overseas animal adoptions and be familiar with how the process works. Um, again, uh, research the organization before agreeing to adopt from them. Be sure to read reviews about the organization and consider asking the organization if you can speak to previous clients. 
Um, if they are reluctant to let you do that, um, you know, that would kind of potentially be a clue that this is an organization that may have something that they're trying to hide. Uh, most, you know, reputable adoption agencies are transparent and, um, you know, are really concerned about the animal's health, safety, and welfare. Um, you want to be sure to independently verify each piece of information given to you about a potential international pet adoption. For example, if the importer gives you the telephone number of the airline for sending the animal, um, look up the airline's telephone number on the internet. And you can also call that uh, airline once you verify the number um, to verify that that dog is actually being shipped by that named importer. Um, and uh, it's important to not send any money uh, requested before the animal is shipped. Um, that is a definite red flag that there could be something wrong. Um, and then um, if you do become aware of uh, some sort of internet or newspaper-based uh, scam or fraud situation, you can report this to the federal authorities. And if you follow the link that I, at the bottom of the slide, you can find out information about reporting these scams. Next slide. So um, I wanted to also talk quickly about some tips for owners um, who are gonna be adopting dogs internationally for uh, preventing the importation and spread of diseases from imported dogs. Um, to do this, uh, we suggest some of these tips. Um, if possible, adopt or purchase pets from reputable local shelters and breeders here in the US. Um, we just uh, know that in general, especially for shelters, they are uh, much more regulated and um, you know, have better safety records. Um, if possible, visit the animal before adoption or purchase. Um, most shelters and rescue groups will evaluate each pet to ensure that they are the right fit for the family. So they'll do some screening questions to make sure that the dog that you're getting will fit with your needs. Um, we recommend that you schedule a veterinary exam uh, for new pets uh, within 10 days of purchase or adoption or even sooner, um, you wanna get them examined right away by your veterinarian. And then um, again, be aware of these scams potentially from overseas suppliers. Next slide. And then last, um, some quick tips for veterinarians for reducing the risk of diseases associated with these imported dogs. Um, veterinarians should report any ill dog with a history of international travel in the previous six months to your state veterinarian and they should be maintaining a high level of suspicion for rabies and other foreign animal diseases or some you know, exotic zoonos, zoonoses that are not commonly found in the US if you, are, um, you, know, if you identify a recently imported dog. Next, uh, report international vaccine records that don't match the age and appearance of the dog to your state veterinarian and consider revaccinating the dogs with these discrepant records as the dogs may not ad be adequately protected against diseases um, such as parvo, distemper, rabies, and others. And lastly, um, you should be familiar with your state's laws, which may require dogs to be revaccinated against rabies with a US licensed rabies vaccine that is not necessarily available in uh, the country where the dog originated. Next slide. Um, this slide just lists some resources that are available to the public and the veterinarians. Um, more information about CDC importation requirements, recommendations for traveling with pets, uh, a listing of the high-risk countries for rabies, and then also a link to our partner, the USDA, for their importation requirements. Also remember to check with the state um, health department um, for your state if there are any additional state requirements. And then, um, there's an email address here, cdcanimalimports at cdc.gov. Please feel free to send any uh, animal, especially dog and cat importation related questions to us. Uh, this is my team's email and we will get an answer to you as soon as possible. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. And thanks to all of today's speakers for your informative presentations. Next slide, please. Links to resources from each presentation are available on our website at cdc.gov slash onehelp slash zohu slash 2022 slash april.html. We do have time for a few questions. Um, as a reminder, please use the Q&A feature in Zoom to send your questions and include the presenter's name or topic. Um, our first question is for Dr. Windling. 
Do we have much data on SARS-CoV-2 in pet ferrets? And does the CDC see vaccinations for susceptible pets like ferrets in the future? Thank you for that question. Um, we have limited data on SARS-CoV-2 in ferrets. However, through a few experimental studies and reports of natural infection, we know that ferrets are susceptible to SARS-CoV-2. Um, there's been one ferret in the US and two ferrets in Slovenia that reported to the OIE that have been confirmed with natural SARS-CoV-2 infection. And um, it's unclear if um, SARS-CoV-2 vaccines for susceptible pets will be widely used in the future. Thank you. Um, and our next question is for Dr. Friedman. Uh, could you describe any kind of outreach CDC has done or is doing with rescue groups that bring dogs into the U.S.? Um, and what kind of health screening is typically done at ports of entry? So thanks for the question. Yes, um, we have reached out to various rescue groups um, to make them aware of our regulations. Um, we do uh, want to uh, continue the safe uh, you know, importation of dogs for rescue from countries that are at low risk. Um, so, um, but uh, right now during the sus temporary suspension, um, we are not going. We are not allowing the importation of dogs from high risk countries for adoptions. Uh, as far as screenings at the uh, ports of entry, so um, the first screening would be by our partners, Customs and Border Protection agents. They would just try and look and make sure the dog is alert and appears responsive. If there is a question about that, um, the, uh, they will reach out to one of the veterinary medical officers on our team and we can do either a video um, consultation. Uh, certain ports uh, do have uh, facilities uh, on site or nearby with veterinarians uh, who can do an exam. Uh, we, we will recommend that the dog be transported to a veterinary clinic uh, if they do uh, seem to be quite ill or need any sort of emergency care uh, right um, before we uh, allow them to be, uh, before we clear them to enter into the U.S. Thank you. Our next question is again for Dr. Wenling. Um, are mink more susceptible to morbidity or mortality from SARS-CoV-2 at certain ages or stages of life? Um, for investigations in the United States, we did see a higher morbidity and mortality rates in um, older mink. But, but that's just was our experience. Thank you. Um, and another question for you, Dr. Wendling. Um, are mink farms that test positive for antibodies through serology counted as infected if there were no positive antigen tests? Um, meat farms that have tested positive for antibodies only are listed on USDA's confirmed cases of SARS-CoV-2 in animals um, website. Um, and there are currently two farms in the US that have been detected through um, antibodies, um, but both of those farms were uh, PCR negative. Um, and so, um, and federal partners are working to develop an assay that will be able to differentiate vaccinated and natural infections. Thank you. And another question for Dr. Friedman, are there any additional considerations in place for individuals who may be fleeing Ukraine into the US with their pets? Uh, yeah, so CDC is definitely aware of the ongoing situation in Ukraine and the surrounding countries. And uh, we are working to expedite dog import permits for persons with personal pet dogs. Um, we we uh, can waive certain requirements. Um, we can... Uh, um, evaluate each individual case on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, and uh, we do know that uh, a lot of the uh, European Union countries in the surrounding area have uh, relaxed some of their entry requirements and uh, dogs uh, are required to have a titer, a rabies titer test to enter the US from Ukraine. And these countries can, you can get the test performed there uh, before uh, applying for a permit. And we can usually get these turned around uh, very quickly. Um, we have seen quite a number of uh, Ukrainian refugees applying for permits and we are clearing them as fast as we can. Thank you. Um, if you have other questions for today's presenters, we've included their email addresses on this slide on the Zohu Paul webpage for today's webinar and in today's email newsletter. A video of today's webinar will be posted within 30 days. Next slide. Um, and a reminder that the next Zohu call is going to be on May 4th. 
Thank you again for your participation. This ends today's webinar.